Welcome to the And She Looked Up Creative Hour podcast with Lisa Bolton and Melissa Hartfield. We're two women who are artists and entrepreneurs, and yes, those two things can go together. This podcast is for the artists, the creators, and the makers who want to find a way to make a living creating what they love. Welcome to episode 17 of the And She Looked Up Creative Hour. I'm Lisa, and today we're going to be talking all about what it's like to work with a partner in a creative business. So normally this is where I would introduce my co-host, Melissa, but today I'm actually going to introduce her as my guest. Hello, Melissa. Hello. So nine years ago, if my math is correct, Melissa co-founded the National Organization Food Bloggers of Canada with two partners. After a few years, one of the partners left, but then her and her remaining co-founder continue to run this business, navigating what is often, I can imagine, a very complex environment when you're working with somebody else. And we thought it would be great today to be able to share Melissa's insight into kind of all the ups and downs and just the nuances of working in a partnership. I think many people can relate to having shared experiences with a friend or a family member or maybe even like a colleague and you say we should start a business together or, we've got these great ideas or we should take that on together but there's so many things to consider when you're going into business with someone and I think for myself as someone who's had gosh over 10 years in just small business commercial banking I can tell you that partnerships always made us nervous. <laughs> Inevitably, there just tended to be a triggering event or a direction that both parties couldn't agree upon. And quite often, the business would become the victim. And, you know, Melissa is a great example of how that's not the case and that there's a lot of upsides to working with a partner. So I think we're just going to jump right in. And maybe we'll start with Melissa can just kind of tell us briefly, you know, how your partnership came to be a little bit of the background, how the three of you came to be, and then ultimately how you pulled the trigger to make it an official partnership. Yeah, uh, we actually, that's my dog sneezing in the background, not me. (laughs) We didn't start out to be a partnership at all. We didn't start out to be a business. So we kind of fell into our partnership, which I don't recommend (laughs) really doing, but for us, it worked out. So we were very lucky, to be quite honest, because uh, we barely knew each other. We had been chit-chatting via Twitter. Um, this was back in 2000, late 2010, early 2011, when Twitter was still very, very active and where people chatted more than they mm-hmm. do now. Were you guys friends? Were you all, how did you know each other? Uh, we just met through food blogging. Oh, okay. Yeah. Food, food bloggers had a tendency in those days to kind of hang out on Twitter in the evening and chit chat with one another. It was very different environment than, than it is today. Ethan knew Marty somehow. And I had been connected to Ethan by somebody because I was looking for a Canadian food blogger who might be able to answer some questions I had about, I don't even remember. It might've been something to do with Canadian taxes or just some Canadian info that I wasn't finding in most of the food blogging groups that were out there that were very, U.S. centric at the time. And uh, so the three of us would chit chat on Twitter along with a few other Canadian food bloggers. And uh, I was going to be in Toronto where they were both located at the time for some client work. And so we agreed to meet up for dinner and we started tossing around this idea of how it would be really great to have a place where Canadian food bloggers could meet up and chat because we just didn't have that. That's basically how we started it was never meant to be a business it was really just meant to be kind of like an extension of our hobby food blogging Um, and at the time food blogging was very much a hobby for the three of us and it just snowballed (laughs) from there (laughs) and all of a sudden we wound up uh, three or four months in realizing that we had a business and that changed things we actually formed a business as a partnership so in Canada you can have a a sole proprietorship which is when it's just you which is what my other business is, you can have a partnership, which is when it's you plus one or a few other people, or you can incorporate. We didn't really have any revenue, so incorporating was not a realistic option at that point. And so we decided we would be a partnership, and that's what we did. (laughs) And the rest (laughs) of it, we really just figured it out as we went along. So like I said, probably not the best or smartest way to do it, but, but fortunately for us, it worked out. Once you started this partnership and you kind of became official, how did you initially tackle who would do what? Because there's always jobs that people don't want to do or that are less fun. There's jobs that people might be naturally better at. So how did you guys sort of divide 
that up and decide what role you would each play. So this is the, one of the benefits of having a partnership is that ideally you'll be in a situation where you're working with another person or a couple of other people and you all have different skill sets. So the division of labor is quite organic. It's just very obvious that this person's going to do this piece and this person's going to do that piece. And we were fairly lucky in that that was pretty much the case for us. We all had full-time gigs. Like, like I said, this was not meant to be a business. So we all kind of had different things we brought to it. I was the only one who was working from home who was self-employed at that time. Ethan and Marty both had full-time employment. Ethan was in the sports marketing world and Marty was a teacher. So because I was the one who worked from home, I had more flexibility over my time. I, I could do things in the middle of the day if they needed to be done. And I was also um, doing a lot of web design work at that time. So I obviously became the person who would manage and create the website. Ethan had a very strong background in sales and marketing. So that was kind of more his area. And Marty had a lot of food blogging and connections. And she was the one who was very comfortable reaching out to people. Uh, and that's where we started. And then as time went on, we kind of created some overlap so that no one person really had to do everything. Or if one of us couldn't do something, um, the others could pick up the slack. We also had a lot of similar I mean, we were all food bloggers. We also all had a lot of experience with hosting and holding events, which was something that came up very quickly for us. The only place where we struggled was admin and finance. None of us really liked doing that. Mm -hmm. And none of us excelled at that. And I wound up with finance just by default because I was slightly better at it than the others because I had been running my own business for a year at that point. And so I had been I had an accountant and we wound up using my accountant as, as the business's accountant. And I, you know, I kind of knew the things that we needed to keep track of and, and that kind of stuff, but by no means, I mean, I've said this many times on this podcast, I hate bookkeeping. <laughs> it's my least favorite thing to do. I just wound up with it by default. And that wound up being the first thing that we outsourced because it just wasn't a strong, strong suit for any of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's really key when you got a partnership is recognizing yeah, strengths, definitely strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes it's bootstrapping at the beginning and you've just kind of, everyone's got to have all hands on deck. But then as soon as you can afford to or have the time to be able to evaluate those tasks and consider that maybe it's not just division of labor, but it in fact is outsourcing of some of the labor that neither one of you should be doing. And it also brings a third party in, which can, I think, be helpful sometimes when you, especially when you've got dual partnerships. Yeah, definitely. We, we got to a point very quickly where we... We needed to charge GST, which meant we needed to go through the process of, which is the goods, National Goods and Services Tax in Canada, which meant we needed to go through the process of applying for that, which meant we had to bring an accountant on fairly quickly. We couldn't afford a bookkeeper till we were, I think we were in year three, maybe four. It took us a while. It's one thing I wish we had done sooner. But, you know, yeah, it's very true. When you're bootstrapping, um, which we definitely were, you need to figure it out amongst yourselves. And that's where that's where a partnership can be really nice because you're not in it alone. Even though bookkeeping was my task, I wasn't abandoned to it. You know, mm -hmm. like I had people there who I could bounce things off of and who I could talk to and who I could vent to. So um, that's one of the nice things of a partnership is there's always somebody else there to share the load. Now, did you, thinking back to sort of the beginning, did you have any apprehension about going into this? Like you're talking about this idea. Did you think maybe I should just do this on my own? Or did you, were you nervous about getting into with people that were, I mean, I'll, I'll call them internet friends. That's what I call people that I, <laughs> I seem to have a relationship with. I've met through online and then you, you sort of get to think of them as friends. But how did that, did you, what were your initial thoughts on all of that? Honestly, no, we were just too naive. <laughs> like, we really just... Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> yeah, it, completely. Um, and I think if I knew now what, or, or if I knew then what I know now, I would approach it very differently. And, and you and I have a partnership and that's been approached very differently from my end than FBC was. But yeah, we were just, we didn't know what we were doing, not just with a partnership, but with the entire business. We were just kind of like okay, <laughs> let's see what happens today. <laughs> and kind of dealing with things as they came up. So no, I, I never had a point where I was like, this is really dumb. You shouldn't be doing this. Like you don't even know these people. It was just like, oh, okay, well, we started this thing and, and people were really excited about what we had started very quickly. So mm -hmm. it, it did just roll along and we were 
almost playing catch up the whole way, kind of trying to keep up with it. So it wasn't probably the smartest thing to do. And, and looking back on it and looking at the people who I wound up with in that situation, we were very lucky in that the things that I would look for in a partner today were there. We just didn't recognize them at the time. So, so that was very fortunate. <laughs> and that does not happen a lot. And when we hit the two year mark, as you referenced, Marty left. And it's interesting because the very first, obviously, we had to go through some administrative things to make that happen. And that was the first question that everybody asked us from our banker to our lawyer to our accountant, you know, was, was there a fight? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are you leaving on good terms? And we were. So we weren't dealing with that. But it was like, obviously, they had been through this situation many times. And they they knew that the likelihood was that we were not leaving on good terms. But um, that was a weird question for us to field at that point, because we couldn't understand why everybody was so fixated on what did you have a fight? And it's like, no, we're fine. (laughs) Yeah, things change. With people that are listening that are maybe thinking about going into business with a partner, whether it is a good friend, or whether it's more of an acquaintance, how much do you think is just trusting your gut versus no, here's here's the due diligence you should be doing. Like, do you think of things that questions you would ask going forward or do you really feel like you kind of just know if it's the right fit or not? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, mm. obviously for us, it was gut <laughs> at the yeah, beginning. Yeah. But having done this now for nine years, the one thing I can say about a partnership is that it's essentially a marriage. I always joke it's a marriage without the fun parts. <laughs> 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 but, it, you know, if you've been in a long-term relationship, This is essentially what it is. And you are legally responsible to one another. And you're legally responsible for this child, this business, which is like a child that you have created. And it's your job to grow it and turn it into a good corporate citizen. If you've been in a long-term relationship, you know that there are times where things are rocky and there are times where things are good. You know that when you're bringing up children, there's awesome parts about it. And there's other parts that are really frustrating. And you question like, am I doing the right thing here? Am I going to regret this later? When you're heading into that situation, if it's something that you're considering, the things that I would seriously look at, the big things would be just like with a a partner or spouse, you want somebody who you have a similar morals and ethics, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? You don't want to be in a, in a, a partnership with somebody who is going to do something that makes you feel very uncomfortable, either from a moral, ethical, or even legal standpoint. And that's really important. That's one of the things that I do really value about Ethan is him and I rarely disagree on anything like that. We're not the same on everything. We don't agree completely on everything, but but the variance, Mm -hmm. the degree of difference on things is very small. So we're usually able to work it out. And the other one is your attitude towards money. You know, how many marriages split up because one's a spender and one's a saver and they just can't bring those two worlds together and it just causes conflict. And that is definitely, that can definitely carry over into a partnership. It is essentially, if you two don't agree on on the money side of things, you're going to have a lot of dispute. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, in our case, we, we both really wanted to avoid debt. That was really important to us. We were both uh, very committed to bootstrapping and we also had a very, this is another one that I hadn't thought of actually, but we had a very similar tolerance for risk. Mm. I think that's a big one too. I would say we were careful with money, but we were not afraid to take calculated risks with money if we felt that it could pay off in the long run. So we did, there were a couple of instances in the, throughout the business where I can definitely think of uh, times where we took a leap with dollars and it paid off, but it was a very calculated leap and we were very much on the same page with it. You know, if one of you is a spender and one of you is a saver or one of you has no issue racking up debt to go into business and the other one does, you're you're going to have a lot of tension. You touched on three things there that I think we could expand on. So you touched on sort of disagreements, talked on money and risk tolerance. So I kind of want to go back to the disagreements for a minute because you had an interesting situation because you started out with three of you, which Mm -hmm. to me implies there's always a tiebreaker. So some, you know, there's likely someone's, you know, teaming, you're on team A or B. And then 
that seems very clear to me as to how you could kind of not come to an impasse on things. But then when you moved to just being the two of you, how did you handle things? Because as much as I'm sure you're on the page for a lot of things, there has to be situations that came up that, you know, you were going north and he wanted to go south. So how did you handle those disagreements? And then I guess the follow up to that would be what did you what would you tell somebody who was planning and thinking about going into partnership how to handle those agreements or disagreements going forward? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. That was one of the things I missed when Marty left is that there was always a tiebreaker. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you didn't get your way, you at least knew that you were in the minority. (laughs) And (laughs) and that's just a democracy, right? Absolutely. Um, (laughs) When there's just two of you, when somebody doesn't get their way, it's not necessarily that you were in the minority. It's just that the other argument won out. And that's, we haven't had too many really big disagreements, um, fortunately. And I think that's because of the fact that we are very much on the same page in terms of those big three that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) it does happen. And just like any relationship, you are going to have to compromise sometimes. This is one of the reasons why I do like having a sole proprietorship as well, because I have one business where I am the boss. (laughs) (laughs) And then I have another business where I'm a partner it's very different. And so, you know, one of the nice things about Ethan is that he's never said, oh, that's a stupid idea or like made me feel like I couldn't come to him with an idea. There have been many times where he has not necessarily jumped up and down on the table when I brought an idea to the table, (laughs) but he's always kind of um, just said, okay, well convince me because I am very much a gut person. I go very much by my gut. And there have been times where I've gone to him and said, we need to do this. Why? Because we just do, because I just know we do like, that's not good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. I have to convince him. And the same goes for him with, with me, like in some ways that's really good. And, and if you if you have something that is really important to you that you really want to do and you feel like it's the right thing, especially if you're somebody who goes by their gut like I am, it really forced me to step back, do some research, and present a case to him. And that's not a bad thing when you run mm-hmm. a business because you probably should be doing that anyway. <laughs> he has also learned over the years that, that my gut usually is pretty good as he has gotten more used to working with me. I think he has, he takes more notice when I come to him and say like, I, I really think we need to do this. I can't really explain why it's just something I know we need to do. And so he's a lot more willing to, to listen Mm -hmm. to that kind of thing. But, um, there, there have definitely been times where (laughs) one of us has not gotten our way and you, you kind of have a sulk about it for a little bit. And then Mm -hmm. you, realize like okay like we just need to get on with this and move forward or you have to figure out a compromise right something that you can both agree on that's maybe not 100 percent what either of you want but at least it allows you to move forward and you know just like a good marriage or a good relationship communication is really important and that was that was a hard one for us to learn when there was three of us if there was an argument one person could always walk away you know, and just have a few days to cool down or think things through. And the other two would just carry on and let that person have their space. But when there's only two of you, mm-hmm. um, you can't do that all the time. Like there have been times where we've had an argument and literally half an hour later, we have to put on a united front for something that we're doing publicly. And that's really hard to do, especially <laughs> if you're a bad actor like I am, <laughs> unless you've figured it out. And I don't like to bring in gender stereotypes, because I don't think they're always very helpful. But if you were going to apply a gender stereotype to this, if you know, Ethan was like the typical in quotation marks, male who doesn't want to necessarily talk. And Mm -hmm. I'm the one who we have to talk this out, we have to talk it out. Right. (laughs) As a side note, if there were being in a male female partnership, if you think that there's differences in your situation, and I agree with you that you can't, it's certainly not a broad brushstroke. But would you say that, yeah, that you fell into some of those traditional gender roles sometimes? Communicating, yeah. Eh, arguing, I don't know so much. Um, we have very, we are very different people. I'm the type of person who can get angry very quickly, but I'm also the type of person who can be over it very quickly. Like, okay, I've, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm over it. Let's keep going. You know, he tends to be the type of person who just needs to 
have some time to himself to kind of cool off. And usually I'm all cooled off long before he is and I'm raring to go and he just needs time. And that was one of the things I had to learn is like, I just have to give him time. Yeah. But in terms of like, we had other gender issues that weren't really about our relationship, but more with how we were treated in the business world, which we can talk about. That was very eye opening and very upsetting to me, (laughs) to be quite honest. Well, while we're talking about gender roles, let's dig into that because I think you and I have spoken about this before and it is something that you, unless you're in a partnership with someone of the opposite sex, you might not be in tune to this as much, but you really did experience some very memorable moments over your years in conversations with third parties or contractors or clients where your partnership wasn't necessarily treated equal. We did. And to be very clear, Ethan's never treated me that way. Like I Mm -hmm. I just want to make that very clear. He's always treated me 100% as an equal. And I've never felt like there was any kind of gender issues with us. It was very strange for me. So, so in my previous career, you know, I worked in IT, which is a field that is often just fraught with gender issues. But to be very honest, I never experienced them. I was very fortunate. I worked in a very male dominated environment, but I was, I never felt like I was treated differently or um, because of the fact that I was a woman. So I very fortunate there. And in my other jobs, I was often in a more female dominated culture. So again, never an issue. And then when I went to work for myself, you know, I never had issues with clients. And I think probably the reason for that is because if you have an issue working with a woman, you don't hire a woman, right? (laughs) So, you know, the people I was working with were people who were 100% okay with me being the person that they work with. But when Ethan and I started working together, It was quite shocking to me because at this point I was in my late 30s and I had never really experienced this. It was very new to me and I didn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think you think by the time you get to that point in your career, like that's just not going to be an issue. But we had things like issues with the bank um, because I managed all the finances and I, I got called Mrs. Adeland, which is Ethan's last name, frequently. Mm -hmm. People assumed we were married or in a relationship. If I went to the bank without him or went to a meeting without him, I would be questioned on it. Where's your husband? (laughs) Well, he's not my husband. He's he's my business partner. Um, Things like that. It was like, what? Like, where are we? Is this 1950? Like, am I not allowed to be out and about without my husband with me? It was kind of like people looked at it and went, well, it's a man and a woman in a business partnership. They must be married. They must be involved, which we are not and never have been. Other things, when we would go into meetings, um, people would speak to Ethan but wouldn't make eye contact with me, like to the point where I would actually wonder if there was something on my face. Like oh. <laughs> they don't want to look at me because I've like I've got spinach in my teeth and they don't want to start laughing. Ethan didn't notice it at first, and it wasn't until I can't remember what it was that triggered the the instance, but um He said to me, we were on the phone and he said to me, you're right. People don't pay attention to you when we go into a room. And he's like, I never noticed this before, but he's like, they don't even make eye contact with you. And I burst into tears on the phone because I was starting to think I was going crazy. Like Mm. literally, like, am I the only person who sees this? And to have somebody validate that I was not going crazy just made me burst into tears. Oh, wow. Um, and once he recognized it, he s- really stepped up and started making uh, steps to ensure that that didn't happen. And one of the, we we wound up changing banks because of the way I was treated. Oh. <laughs> I remember we went in to meet with a different bank, and um, we had been connected with a friend of Ethan's who worked for this bank and was quite high up. And it was at the main branch in Vancouver instead of one of the local suburb branches. And uh, we went in to this meeting with two men. <laughs> We sat down and Ethan was like, you know, this is 
Melissa does the banking. She's the one you need to convince, right? Like she's the finance person. And we actually wound up telling them like what I had been through at the other bank. And I said, like, I'm just looking, I told them I'm looking for a banking boyfriend. Like, I just want somebody who's going to listen to me, who's <laughs> going to pay attention to me and, and not talk down to me and treat me like I am the owner of this business. Mm -hmm. And they were wonderful, I have to say, and, and really did step up. And we've had a great relationship with that bank ever since. But it just shocked me that that was the only way to deal with it was to switch banks and make it very clear at the time of switching that this is the reason we're switching. I suspect your experience is not unique for people in a male-female business partnership. I do think that that is probably regrettably something that does happen even still to this day. It shocks me to think that that wasn't that long ago that you we're experiencing that. It still happens today. Ethan is often the person that people will reach out to when it comes to anything from a business, financial, sales, making money perspective. Well, what I think is important about sharing those experiences is what others can take away from that too. And it sounds like, first of all, the fact that Ethan became perceptive or was perceptive to it. Like, I think it's super awesome that you had a partner in this that was like, this is not okay. And I'm not going to contribute, you know, to this and I'm going to take a stand. So I think having a partner that was supportive of that way is really key. But that probably comes also from checking in with your partner and having those conversations. And if people are entering into a partnership, whether it's someone of the same gender or not, I think making a point to check in on is there anything that's been bugging you or you notice anything yeah. or like having those not letting too much time go by so that there's an opportunity for someone to say like, I'm feeling marginalized here. I'm feeling invisible. I'm not feeling equal and we need to address that. And it may not be the partner that's making you feel that way. It could be somebody external to your business. And regardless of, of the gender, I think being able to have those frank conversations with your partner and then if your partner is the one that comes to you and tells you that, you know, taking action and, and validating those feelings are really important for the protection of the business too. Yeah, it is. I think it's really important. And that was something we weren't terribly good at in the early days. Um, it really did take us a while to uh, get a rhythm of like how to communicate and how to appreciate each other's work styles. That's another big one. We have very different working styles. And that has the tendency sometimes to drive either of us crazy. All those things, we didn't really have to deal with them while Marty was with us because there was just always three of us. But when it came down to the two of us, it really took us probably a good two years to kind of figure out how to navigate our relationship, which I think is true of any serious relationship, any long-term relationship. It takes a while to kind of get a feel for all the quirks and the different ways that you communicate, the different ways that you work. And be able to accept them. I think you actually, you have to go through all the seasons with someone. I really believe that. Like just even at minimum, because a year, at least a year gives you a chance to see all the good. There's going to be some hiccups. There's going to be changes. It's like when you move into a new house, you don't move in, I don't think, and renovate right away. I think sometimes you got to live in the space for a bit and just get a feel for what those rhythms are and what the patterns are and what do we do the most of and where's our weak spots and then you can make some really informed choices. Yeah, it's like when you start dating somebody, you know, you're on your best behavior for the first six months, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you don't want them to see the crazy in the first week. <laughs> so you kind of, it takes a while before you get really comfortable and start to let your guard down and really let who you are come out that can be stressful and it can be hard to kind of deal with at first. But yeah, it took us, I, I would say it was a good two years before we kind of got to a point where it was like, okay, this is how you do things. That's cool. This is how I'm going to do it. I hope that's cool with you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you're the, t you know, I don't think partnerships are for everyone. And I do think if you're the type who really has trouble letting things go that are out of your control, you're going to struggle with a partnership. There are certain ways that he does things that just drive me crazy. It's not because he's doing them wrong. It's because it's it's me that has the issue. Like that's mm -hmm. the thing I had to realize. This is not his issue. This is how he does things. And at the end of the day, he gets what he needs to get done, done. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who has an issue with it. Like I either need to let it go mm -hmm. or leave because <laughs> yeah. he's not going to change. And I think a lot of people uh, don't necessarily realize that or aren't willing to 
let things go. But I really, there were a few things where I just had to be like, the only one here who has a problem with this is you. So Mm -hmm. you need to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, The business isn't suffering because of the way. No, and that's just it. Like these were not like, I don't want to, I don't want to put Ethan's life out there, but just, just small things in the way that he works. It's just like a weird little quirk that he might have that I just do. And it's like, oh my God, like that just drives me nuts. But you know what? It doesn't impact his work. Mm -hmm. It just drives me crazy. And, and why does it drive me crazy? Like that was the question I had to ask. Like, why does this bug you so much? Because it's not impacting anything. That's a great, um, I think that's a great exercise for someone in a partnership before, um, you communicate with them if there is something that's been bothering you. I think there's two pieces to that is let it sit for a while. So see if it continues to bother you. Because sometimes things bother you once or twice and then it's really easy to let it go and be like, oh, that's just a quirk. And then sometimes things can continually bother you time and time and time again. And you have to ask yourself, yes, why does it bother me? Who is it hurting? Would our business be different if this you know, if he didn't hold his pencil this way, but he does and it drives me bananas, you know, and I think just really checking yourself on those things, because I think it'd be really easy, especially for entrepreneurs who tend to be people that are control. Yes, they are. <laughs> we are. I was trying to think of a nicer way, but you're right. No, well, but they know what they want. They have a vision. They know how they want it executed. So they're already in a lane. And to share that lane with someone sometimes, things can get crowded. Checking yourself before you check your partner, I think, is just a really good step for anybody looking to team up with someone else. And one of the things that helped me a little bit with that was just asking him why he did, like, why why do you do that that way? Um, And sometimes just, you know, the explanation was all I needed to just let it go, right? And sometimes the explanation just made it seem even stranger. But, But again, my issue, not his. And I think that's something that, that can be really hard to realize in any kind of relationship that you're in. Like, like, yeah, this is, if he had been doing something that was jeopardizing our business or putting us into a bad situation, that would be very different. And you would need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But that's the question you need to ask. Like, is this impacting anyone but me (laughs) learning to kind of let it go? And another thing that, um, we really, this came over time as well. Um, but was really just staying out of each other's lane. Like Mm. at this point in our business and, after Marty left, we really did have to divide the labor up because at that point we decided to, uh, Ethan left his job and I scaled back my business. And so it really became our full time gig. And we had to kind of figure out a way to divide the labor so that we, A, knew what, what our jobs were, but B, so we weren't stepping on each other's toes. And so to, to be pretty blunt, Ethan stays out of my lane and I stay out of his. We rarely get into each other's space. He has his things that he does. If there's anything important going on, he communicates it to me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we really don't get in each other's way. We don't micromanage each other at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. You kind of have to, and that comes with time, right? You have to develop a level of trust where Ethan's going to go do what he needs to do. And I trust him to do what's in the best interests of our business. And Absolutely. You talked a little bit about money a little when we were talking about back with the banking and stuff. How did you handle money in terms of twofold, I guess, expenses being the first part and then deciding how much to take from the business? Like how did you guys, without getting into the numbers per se, I'm just curious as to how those conversations, when did you decide, how do you decide who does what, how did, did it always seem fair in terms of that, you know, we talked about division of labor. Did it feel mm-hmm ever feel unfair to you or how did you handle the money stuff? Because I do think, like you said perfectly in a a marriage, that can be the source of so much stress. I Mm can't imagine that it wasn't the source of stress in the business as well. It hasn't been very stressful for us, mainly in part to the fact that our accountant uh, is very strict about how we're allowed to do things. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I'm not sure what you meant by expenses. Did you mean like how we decided what to spend our money on? Yeah, like if you come across an opportunity that you want to spend your money, is it sort of like certain dollar amounts are decided or do you just sort of spend and trust? Is there always a conversation? How did you guys decide how much spending quote unquote authority a person has? Yeah, so we don't really have, I mean, we tend to discuss financial purchases 
before we make them. Um, there has been the odd occasion where one of us has taken a course or taken a client out for um, a, a drink or a lunch or something and not had that conversation because generally speaking, we're not spending more than $100. We were on a shoestring in the early days. There was no money. Any money that got made just stayed in our bank account <laughs> um, and paid our hosting fees, essentially. Most money decisions we discuss absolutely anything big we would discuss. And then in terms of getting paid and things like that, that is something our accountant is very strict with us on in terms of keeping things equal. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember once we had a conversation with her about something. We were thinking of bringing in a service or something, but it would be me who was essentially dispensing the service. And I think I asked her if it would be okay if I build the company from my sole prop as like a freelancer for doing this because it was going to be taking up quite a bit more of my time. Mm -hmm. And she flat out said, no, like Mm -hmm. absolutely not. (laughs) She's like, that starts tipping scales and you're not, I'm not going to let you guys do that. So, um, so, and that was the right answer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Once the business earned enough that we could start taking salaries, she put us on payroll. So we are, we are employees of the business. We, we incorporated shortly before Marty left, actually. So she put us on salary, like salaries. So do like we are we are 50 50 on everything money wise, 100%. Yeah, which is great. And that's good when it works out that way, or you can really easily and both parties agree. And there's no confusion over that. I do think it's a very important conversation to have if you're going into new partnerships to talk about the money stuff and to talk about budgets and to really have a clear understanding of what even I would say have a clear understanding of what living or running a business on a budget looks like because your idea of a budget item and mine might be vastly different and if you've got two people going into business together and you're making those spending decisions you just want to make sure you're on the same page and on the flip side of that I think there's a security piece to the financial side of a partnership that's important not to take for granted. So not unlike a prenup, (laughs) if you're coming into a partnership where there is going to be borrowing money or if you're making financial commitments and are going to have obligations going forward, that there's a clear understanding of protection in there. And whether that's you require, you know, two signatures on larger amounts or whether you've got it documented that, you know, these discussions or meetings, official meetings have to be held, something, and it may sound really formal and very businessy for just, you know, two artists that want together to form a company, but I really feel strongly about having those conversations and setting up systems ahead of time because everyone goes in with the intention that it's going to work, and there's a 50% divorce rate in marriages for a reason. (laughs) Partnerships fail more often than they work. If you can go in and have these conversations ahead of time and protect yourself ahead of time, it's going to save you on the end if for something, for some reason, it doesn't work out because sometimes they just don't. So I just like the idea of people really making sure that they've addressed that stuff. You can go with your gut when it comes to instinct on business things, but when it comes to your finances, I, I do believe in having a plan in place. Yeah. And this is where having professionals um, to help you is really useful. So, you know, when when Marty left, our accountants dealt with all of that. It removed us from the the discussions. So that was dealt with by them. And, you know, like I said, our accountant painstakingly (laughs) works to keep us 50, 50. We are 50. We both own 50% of the shares of the business. When we run things by our lawyer, it's always done with the impact it would have on us as equal partners. When you have those professionals in your corner, their job is to to make sure that you're doing everything correctly, but they also take the emotion out of it, right? They, they come, you know, if you're Mm -hmm. coming to something, they can sit you both down and say, this is why we're going to do it this way. And this is the reason it needs to be done this way. And I know it may seem like this is, you know, this person's getting more, this person's getting less, but like, they just, they take the emotion out. It's, you know, and I, I, maybe some people would have still find that hard, but Ethan and I are, are both fairly logical people. So somebody can explain something to us. You know, when we did our first conference, we had to put down four equal deposits on the venue before we could do the conference. And Mm -hmm. the first deposit was $6,400 or something like that was, that was the first of the four. We didn't have $6,400 in the company bank account. So we all came up with two grand of our own to put in to 
the business to pay this deposit. And I didn't even have two grand. I was in my first year of being self-employed. And so I actually wound up having to borrow 700 that to be paid back later. So we found ourselves in a situation very early where, you know, we were putting our personal money in and that was, I believe that was the only time we put our personal money into the business. Then the business had to pay us all back. And then I had to pay Ethan back for the, what I had borrowed from him to make up my, my equal amount of the payment. So, you know, and that was a good exercise, I guess, to go through early because we, it really did emphasize the fact that we were all on the same page. It can get tricky, especially in those early days when you don't have a lot of money. Like, And maybe you know. some of the solution too is not feeling that you have to bring on a professional full-time on retainer in the beginning. Often spending a few hundred dollars on a, on a couple hour conversation with a lawyer or an accountant can be super beneficial and good money well spent before you maybe bring on someone on a more regular basis. But even just investing in that advice with the with a third party is a good start for for partnerships that are just getting formed yeah and we're nine years in and um we do not have retainers with either of our our accountant or our lawyer they are on an as-needed basis in the early days it, it's it's definitely helpful to have those people that you can can take questions to especially if you're like us and you know don't know what you're doing right <laughs> <laughs> What would you say, like, I kind of want to get a sense from you as to like what the highlights are from having a partner and, and then what some of the downsides have been, you know, and I, and I know you and Ethan have a super healthy, positive working relationship. So again, when I talk about the downsides of a partnership, certainly not to be reflective on Ethan as an individual or in this role, but what, what are some of the downsides of a partnership? Like if someone's really evaluating, do I do this on my own or should I bring on somebody? I'd like, why don't we start with the downside and then we can... We can finish up on the upside. And on a high note. <laughs> exactly. So what are some of the disadvantages you found in your experience of a partnership that didn't weren't deal breakers, but just, just kind of were like, oh, this is tougher because you've got a unique perspective of concurrently running both sole proprietorships and partnerships. Yeah. To be, to be completely honest, if you asked me which I prefer, a sole prop or a a partnership, I don't think I'd be able to answer mm -hmm. um, because I really enjoy both of them, but for very different reasons. And I think when it comes to the cons of a partnership, um, the big one is that you never get to make a decision on your own. You know, you <laughs> always have to be in, I don't want to say agreement because you're not always in agreement, but you, you do have to run things by each other, um, especially when it comes to big things about moving the business forward. You know, if you're a quick starter, if you're the type of person who who comes up with ideas and you like to execute them right away, not shiny object syndrome, but you know, you see an opportunity and you just want to run with it. Can't do that in a partnership. You need to hold back. Mm -hmm. And I am this type of person. So this is from, pump the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I have to like go, whoa, okay, I need to wait till tomorrow morning when it's okay to call Ethan because that's another thing you that you do need to do when you have a partnership is there do you need to be boundaries on when you talk to each other and things like that. So Got to wait until tomorrow and then we're going to have to have a conversation with about with him about it. And if he doesn't agree, I'm going to have to convince him. Uh -huh. So it just slows me right down. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're like me and you're the type of person who likes to move really fast, it can be frustrating. So <laughs> that's where having my sole proprietorship makes me makes me happy it's like if I want to do something I can do it right now <laughs> do it when you're in the mood when the iron like strike when the iron's hot kind of thing and I think that's that's one of the other downsides of a, a partnership is that it is it it's a constant state of compromise you know when you when you do agree it's that's great but generally speaking there's always a little bit of compromise that goes along with every decision for both sides and you never really 100% feel like like you got your own way. A partnership is about the two or three or four of you. And it should kind of reflect that, I think. It shouldn't be one person's personality dominating the business. No, a partnership should add value, right? Like yeah, I think when you're exactly. considering it, you're taking on a partner, not it's not on as a burden. You're taking on a partner when you're looking at a partner. It should be how is this going to add value to this entity, this this widget, this baby that we made? How is Absolutely. it going to not only enrich the business, but enrich my experience in it? And am I going to be a better business owner? Am I going to run this business better as a result of having this person 
be on board with me. And and I think that speaks to your own mental health all the way through to the you know, strategic direction you take the company and everything in between. Like you need to ask those questions and that's the reason to take one on, not, you know, that. so it should be about where they, where they can add value. And we're talking about equal partnerships here. Um, mm-hmm, of course. It is completely possible to take on a partner and have it be like a 60, 40 or a 70, 30, or even a 51, 49 split. Right. So in, in those instances, the person with the majority of the business will be the tiebreaker because they own more of the business. But in our case, it was always a completely equal Mm -hmm. split, whether there was two or three of us. Those are kind of the big cons, I guess, for Mm -hmm. me is just, um, you know, it's not all about you when you own a partnership. It's it's about the business more, so to speak, I guess. It's funny Um, how you said never make, you know, you don't can't make a decision alone. And I almost think that could be a con and a pro though, because mm -hmm. you also don't have to make a decision alone. And sometimes there's a lot of comfort in that. Yes. And, you know, if you want to end on, on the pros and on the high, high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that is exactly it. One of the things, one of the cons about having a, a sole proprietorship is that you have to make all the decisions by yourself. And that can be really scary sometimes. And mm-hmm. um, you can start to feel very insecure about your decision making process. And you can, you know, I am a, a quick starter. And I when I do kind of come up with an idea, I do like to execute it quickly. But then there are those other things where I'm not really sure if it's right. And then you start to have a lot of insecurity about it and it can almost freeze you. Like you just become frozen. And I, I notice with a lot of clients who are sole proprietorships, they, they suffer from decision fatigue because it's just so many decisions that you have to make when you own a business. It's just, I feel mm-hmm. like 90% of your day is just making decisions sometimes. <laughs> you know, if you're unsure about those decisions, it can paralyze you to the point where you don't move forward. But when you have a partner, it's like, it frees up a lot of mental energy, I guess, is the best way to describe it. It's like you're all you always have a partner in crime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe, maybe not in crime, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but you have someone who will take your hand and say, nope, we're doing this. Let's go. Or that's someone right. that's going to pull you back and be like, whoa, no. <laughs> it's, uh, you're never making a decision alone. You, you know, if you screw up, you screw up together. Mm-hmm. And by the same token, if you succeed... You have somebody to celebrate with, you know, when you work for yourself, by yourself and something goes really well and you're kind of like, you know, looking around the room for somebody to high five and there's <laughs> nobody to high five and you're like, yeah. oh, okay. you sit at your desk and go, well, that was a good day, Melissa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but when you have a partner, you know, you can, you have those moments where it's like you mm-hmm. get to share that success and, and it makes it feel, you know, so much more fulfilling, I guess. is And, and that's one of the really nice things I think about. A partnership is it's just having that person or people to share it with. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's a very human thing to want to to share experiences with. And so when you have partners, you get to do that. That's really nice. And and it's also nice knowing that if you screw up or you fail, you just pick each other back up and you move forward. One of the other things I like about a partnership is that there's there's always a little bit of tension. And I think that's a good thing. You're two different people. Like there's just always, I don't mean tension in a bad way. I just mean tension in like the pure sense of the word. Like there's always, there's always a little bit of push, pull, give and take, push, pull. Like the trick is you want it to be a gentle tension. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want it to be the kind of tension that just overwhelms the room. But ideally your partner is going to push you out of your comfort zone when you need to. Mm -hmm. And they're going to pull back on the reins when you need to. And you're going to do the same thing for them. If if you are both scared of the same things, mm-hmm. you're never going to get past that. But ideally, your partner is going to be someone who, you know, like in, in my case, Ethan and I, I would say we're both introverts in the, in the classic sense of the word that we both regain energy from being alone. Mm-hmm. But he is a very outgoing introvert. Like he loves talking to people. He loves um, getting out there. He loves going to events. I don't. And so he pulls me out of that like there's times where he'll say to me you need to put on your e card today meaning my extrovert card Mm -hmm. because you know we need to do this and and if I had been left to myself I would have just stayed home (laughs) (laughs) that's one of the benefits of having a partner is there's always somebody there you know just parallels between a business partnership and a romantic partner they're endless endless they're so endless you know you know how hard you work in your marriage right to Mm -hmm. to keep things on an even keel well to be clear my marriage is 51 49 for me he might (laughs) not know that i don't think he read the fine print (laughs) 
<laughs> anyway, you know what I mean? Like, oh, it just, totally. from, from that perspective, is, you know, it takes a lot of work. And yeah. not just to get through the day of all the things you need to do in a day, but just to get through the day together and not be at each other's throat. Well, I will just say on a side note, this quarantine time has just been the test of all tests for a lot of marriages because Absolutely. you are together all the time and suddenly you're kind of realizing um, – that you have very different communication styles. Like my husband and I have been together over 20 years. And so I know the ebbs and flows of how we fight or disagree and how we are on the same page on things. Like it's evident, but when we, in other times where we kind of go our separate ways throughout the day and we spend more time apart, it's been under a microscope now since the quarantines happened. And it's it took us a few weeks to get into a rhythm again, like of yeah. spending so much time and understanding like, oh, I forgot. Yes. And oh, you're in my lane, get out of my lane. And it's really been interesting. And you find your groove and there's it's just been very uh, enlightening to see us get back into that space. And I think you're absolutely right. Like everything you say about that could be about a marriage that way could be applied to taking on a business partner. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, we have this kid mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're responsible for, like legally responsible for, and that needs to be a good corporate citizen. It's our job to make sure that happens and to make sure that it's healthy and that it's growing and doing all the things that a kid should do. That was another important thing, Ethan. And I realized probably around the two year mark is that we needed to put boundaries in of like when we would communicate, how often we would talk, uh, when it was appropriate to be in contact with each other and things like that. And just put limits around when is our own time, our personal time mm -hmm. and when is business time. And that um, obviously emergencies withstanding. But in other words, you know, like it wasn't like you can just text me at nine o'clock at night because you had a great idea, which I am really guilty of doing. <laughs> we had to put boundaries in place that kind of just made it clear, like when we could be around each other and, and how we would communicate. And at first that was really hard because like, oh, you don't want me talking to you or whatever. You 24 know, seven. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, it was like one of the best things we ever did. Sure, yeah. Same, same in a marriage. You know, you do need time apart. You do need to kind of have your own lives and your own interests as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be completely intertwined in each other's lives all the time. You know, at the end of the day, there's really great things about having a partnership. There's really great things about having a sole prop, but there's cons about both. And that's why I like having both. I kind of feel like I get the best of both worlds. You do. And I, I think it's a really interesting perspective for people because you, you wear both hats. So I think you can speak um, very um, authoritatively on, on both sides of it. And I think no matter what, the theme of all the areas we touched on, whether it was the labor division, the money, the disagreements, the upside, downside, I mean, communication seemed to be the consistent theme through all of those things. It's like, don't sit on stuff. You mm -hmm. need to get in front of it. It needs to be at least talked about at the beginning. It needs to be checked in on on a regular basis. I think it can be very easy to get on a roll with your head down especially when you're starting a business and just go, go, go and, and not taking that time to pause and check in with your partner. And it just, it just really felt like, you know, communication, communication style, understanding each other's preferences on how they want to communicate, when they want to communicate. This is all seemed to be the theme of really the key to a successful partnership. It, it really, really is. And um, I really, have to say that you need to make sure you have phone calls, that it's not just text message or email communication. Like there are times where the two of us will get really busy and we don't talk as much as we normally do. And we talk a lot, but when one or the other or both of us gets busy and our communication starts to dwindle, it really impacts our entire relationship. Like we just tend to get short with each other quicker and we tend to have less patience and things like that. And it really just comes down to the fact, like if we step back away from it, we just can see very clearly that we're not communicating and maybe one of us is feeling neglected or the other's feeling neglected or we're misinterpreting something because it's just short, quick text messages mm -hmm. or we're just reading something into it because that person's busy and, you know, like all, all the things, <laughs> that, yeah. you know, that make it complicated when you're not having good communication. And we just have to recommit to like, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just saying, okay, we're going to have a, a phone call every morning this week for half an hour and just get back on track. And usually that's all it takes is just, mm -hmm. you know, sitting down and reestablishing those lines of communication. But th that is, that is definitely the key. 
Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for that because I think that is incredibly insightful and will be really helpful to people if they're kind of contemplating contemplating a partnership or are currently in a partnership and maybe it's going well or maybe it's not. And I think that kind of gives people some ideas on where they can maybe check in on some of the pain points and, and make some adjustments if they need to. We're going to wrap it up for today. And next week, you're actually going to be talking to me about a book proposal. Yeah, we're going to be talking about how to have a successful book proposal when you don't have an audience. It's totally possible. It so is. We're going to have a really good conversation around that and bust a few myths, I think. Awesome. Well, as always, we love to hear from you. So definitely reach out if you like the episode, leave us a review or send us some feedback. You can catch us on all of the platforms wherever you're listening to us from and uh, we really do appreciate that and hearing from you so we hope you tune in again next week we'll have another episode on friday bye everyone thank you so much for joining us for the and she looked up creative hour be sure to check out the show notes for any links or resources we talked about in this episode if you enjoyed the chat please be sure to subscribe and you will automatically be notified when the new shows are released and we'd love to hear from you drop us a review Tell us where you're listening from, or even just send a note to say hi. You can find us at andshelookedup.com or on Instagram under andshelookedup. Thanks so much for listening.